Hello everyone, can you please take your seats so that we can get started? We have a busy um, session starting. So uh, we're just getting the final ones of those loaded up. 
So, okay. So today is a day of lots of, uh, of presentations, and we um, will we will uh, start the the session shortly as soon as the uh, announcements are loaded up and ready to go. So we have a plenary session of presentations, and then we have a break and another set. Um, I'll moderate this first panel, and Alex will do the second. We have a um, and then we'll introduce the afternoon sessions. We have a few corrections and additions to the um, schedules that you have. Um, at that time, we'll actually uh, assemble for photos. We'll have a representative from ICA meeting us to take us weather dependent on where we go. So um, we'll do that. And the photos will be of the entire group, um, of the women of the group, um, of the under 40s and of the over 60s. So we can just keep track of how we're moving the entire uh, <laughs> group through its, its ages and responsibilities. <laughs> Um, and in, in the afternoon, we move on to uh, the uh, next uh, set of the parallel uh, presentations. Um, and uh, in those sessions, um, yeah, we'll just have the breakout uh, into the various uh, rooms that are assigned here, uh, similar to what we did yesterday. And uh, then we'll all convene back here at 515 for a plenary wrap up. It's important that you come to this not only so that you can hear some of the highlights of um, you know, some of the things that people might wanna offer from the day, but also because we will be escorted to our reception um, in some manner that I don't have the details of, but you will want to be here to be part of that. So uh, please do arrive. Um, and then uh, you know, the, the evening, yeah, we'll let the evening unfold as it will. So um, yes, and at lunchtime, we also have uh, a, a women's group meeting. Uh, men who want to join are, are able to do so as well. Of course, we'll all be in the same sort of general lunch area, um, but we'll have some opportunities for uh, women to have some remarks. Um, Molly Jean has offered uh, or has agreed to uh, provide some comments. Cynthia will also provide some comments. And we, you know, it's just an opportunity to think about uh, the role of women in, in the research uh, and, um, and moving up in some of the ranks um, uh, and populating leadership roles and things like this. So in our regional assessments, we were able to bring several women into leadership capacities that they executed quite well. And there are many other opportunities for um, leadership in work groups uh, and activities of AGMIP. So we just wanna talk about things that enable that or hinder that or any other soft topic of interest. So that's what that's about. Okay, let's get going with our uh, our announcements. So if we can put up the uh, first one, and I think um, we will, since we don't have microphones at the table, we will need people to come up and basically give their um, short spiel. So can we go ahead with the first uh, of the slides, please? Okay, soybean team. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I will be very brief. I would just like to announce that we are starting the new soybean team and we will be meeting during lunch. So if you are interested or you will uh, think there's someone that could be interested, uh, look for me during lunchtime for an initial meeting. Thank you. Okay, our next announcement is Uh, Daniel, yes. So some people here might be interested in this course, this intensive one week course that's gonna be held in Copenhagen under the aegis of, of Maxur later this year and in, in early September. So either you or your students might be interested. And of course you're welcome to sign up, thanks. All right, uh, bad jam. <laughs> That's the acronym of the, they, that gets the acronym award. <laughs> yes, uh, 
this has been presented yesterday in a subsession. I just wanted to, to spread the word to the wider audience. We are organizing this exercise. We are going to uh, bias adjust a number of uh, RCM data through uh, a suite of, uh, uh, of, of different methodologies uh, that to produce data that are going to be fed to crop models. We have a very nice community of badgers, what we call the uh, bias adjusters. In our, in our project, we are just missing a crop modeling community to work with us. And we would like to open this to ACMIP wheat, uh, possibly. And then there's another announcement. This is on behalf of my dear colleague, Andrea Toretti, who is planning to organize, who is planning a, a, a workshop on CO2 fertilization effects uh, uh, yield on yields and quality. The time scale should be September, October, and it's done in collaboration with the FACE uh, group uh, and experts on CO2 and crops. So if anybody is interested in participating in this workshop, the dates are being defined these days, please contact Andrea for more details. Thank you very much. I think that we need to get, be sure, we hope that AGMIP could co-sponsor the workshop. Um, we've uh, did one at the FACE uh, in Illinois this past summer that Delphine uh, Daring and others organized. Um, uh, she was the AGMIP organizer and I, Christoph was there. So let's be, I hope we, I want to encourage, let's be sure to have the modelers there too. This is, this is one of the major areas that we have to move forward with in AGMIP. Thank you. Are there any further announcements? Okay, we're supposed to have a slide, that's okay. Uh, so yeah, we will organize the um, ICROPEM meeting uh, in 2020 in Montpellier, France on February 3 to February 5th. Uh, so that will be a follow-up of the first ICROP meeting uh, jointly organized by the Maxure project in, in Europe and, and AGMIP it was in Berlin in 2016. In 16, yes. Uh, so what we want to do is to organize this three-day meeting, but also run it to organize a whole week around uh, modeling uh, in agriculture. Uh, with, we're thinking about some specific focus uh, of the meeting and, and, this, and the side, uh, let's say, uh, days. Uh, we always, already have a few propositions uh, for side events. Uh, so if you have an interest also in, in, in proposing uh, side events, that's contact us. So at that, at that point, the, the contact point are, are Eric Just, who is here from CIRAD and, and, and myself, and we will uh, shortly, um, I mean, develop a scientific committee and so on. So it will be Montpellier, France, February 2020. All right. Any other announcements that anyone would like to share with or without a slide? Okay, let's move um, on and invite our speakers for this morning session to come to the front table, please. We have Sonali McDermott, Ken Booty, Heidi Weber, Dillis McCarthy, Christoph Muller, and Gideon Kruzman, please. Um, We'll uh, start off in the order that the um, presentations are listed. So Sonali, um, please join us at the podium. Okay. I was hoping with the shuttles, everybody you know, would come on time, which is a good thing rather than coming in late. So this is helpful. Um, uh, so um, I am the co-lead for the AGMIT climate team alongside um, Alex Ruain, who's here as well too. Um, I'm a climate scientist at New York University, um, but today I wanna talk to you about how, um, how we integrate climate information um, into our AGMIP assessments. In fact, I was not my 
Um, so I'll talk really briefly about um, how we represent historical climate um, and how to date we've incorporated information on future climate scenarios. But I'd like to spend the most time talking about um, our expectations for the next generation of climate model outputs coming from CMIP-6 um, and how those can be applied for agricultural applications. Um, and we should mention that um, Alex has a 2015 paper that kind of talks a little bit um, about um, uh, sort of the climate data set. So all of the front information on these slides um, will be contained there. Okay. So firstly, I don't have to convince um, most of the people in this room, um, we need good historical climate data to drive our crop models. Now, ideally that would come in the form of uh, continuous daily observations uh, and for climate analyses for about a 30 year period um, that's uh, situated in the localities where we're modeling. Now, for many of our AgMIP applications and the regions that we're working in, um, that's a bit easier said than done. And so AgMIP has products available to help fill some important gaps in the observed data sets. Um, and so this is um, detailed in the Ruane et al. paper, but the methods we use are to take um, uh, a reliable uh, reanalysis data set. So we've used um, the NASAMERA and the NCAR CFSR um, reanalysis products and apply a common bias adjustment, right? Using the gauges and satellite information um, to create more regionally representative um, data sets for our agricultural assessments. And so these products are available uh, publicly. They're global at about half degree resolution. Um, and they span the 1980 to 2010 daily record for all of our key agroclimatic variables that we use in our crop models. Um, we should say for the regional integrated assessments, um, we use these products primarily to fill gaps in the observed records for which we're missing values. And so we still do rely on having the best observed record possible, but these are useful in case that that's not, um, that's not available. And to just give you a sense of the difference that this can make, um, these are figures made by Michael Glotter um, looking at uh, production um, correlations between model produced results and agricultural statistics, production statistics, um, using the reanalysis if we were to just take it off the shelf and apply it um, on the left or on the right, um, I think we've got a pointer here, yep. On the right, um, uh, if we were to use this bias adjusted um, uh, ag CFSR data set. And as we can see, the correlations improve um, quite a bit. And this is kind of related to a, a broader point that the choice of the historical climate that we use, that data set matters, it's important. Um, what you're looking at here are global gridded um, uh, uh, um, production correlations um, across a different range of available products. And generally, as you move to the higher latitudes, the correlation improves, but for some key AgMIP regions that we're working in, there's quite a bit of variation. And so there needs to be some sort of uh, vetting, right? And understanding of um, the product that, that you use and to just make sure that we understand the variability across these products in the regions that you're working in. Okay. So I know I'm moving a bit quickly here um, in order to get to the updates for CMIP-6, but it's helpful first to review what we did for CMIP-5, right? Our fifth couple model into comparison project. And so what you're looking at here is the experimental architecture behind CMIP-5, which informed the IPCC AR-5. The concentric circles represent groups of experiments that test model sensitivities and scientific research questions. And all groups were responsible for what you see in the pink, that kind of um, core group of experiments here. Now these include sensitivity experiments, they include historically, uh, historically forced experiments, and you'll also note that RCP 4.5 and 8.5 are included within that core set. Um, the result of this being that RCP 4.5 and 8.5 had a bit more emphasis, and so there are more realizations, more modeling groups that attempted those, as opposed to 2.6 and 6. But overall, this is a hugely useful uh, and massive data set, right? We have more than 1,000 model and experiment combinations. Um, and we know that at least 29 climate models um, uh, that have daily output information that ran most of the RCPs. And those are the ones that we're currently using in our regional integrated assessments. So that's a pretty good sample of that model population. 
Um, this project produced hundreds of climate relevant output variables. And we say that um, because these are climate, these are useful to the climate community, right? They're course resolution or aggregated over space and time. And while that's been hugely useful for us to improve our models, it hasn't exactly been the most useful for the impacts assessment communities or agricultural communities. And we'll talk a little bit about what's, what's changed with that moving forward in CMIP 6. Okay, so how did we use in AgMIP um, this CMIP5 data set? Um, I think we all agree, right? It's an AgMIP tenant that we use a multi-model approach, but it was always it was also important for us to kind of comprehensively represent the range of uncertainty in the projected futures across the models. So we select models to kind of sample this uncertainty and the range of projections. And what you're looking at is a scatter plot of precipitation change versus temperature change. Each triangle is one of the 29 global climate models that we sampled. Um, uh, and that box in the middle um, that you see here is about one uh, standard deviation across in temperature and in rainfall. And so this was sort of a useful way for us to split up the distribution of climate models to look at ones that were relatively hot and wet or ones that were relatively cool and dry compared to the distribution of models, okay? This is relative to the model distribution. Now, you can imagine um, by using this kind of quadrant approach, if I sampled a, um, uh, a model from each of those quadrants, I could, you know, and took five climate models, I could probably well represent the range of model uncertainty. And so you can take this method, um, I'll also note relative to the model, our historical baseline is here, right? So all of these models are relatively warmer. Um, for this uh, particular situation. Now, you could take this method and just apply it, um, but we've kind of gone a step beyond that in some of our AgMIP regional assessments. Um, and the reason that that's important to do some, um, some additional vetting, um, and this is close to my heart as I work on the South Asian monsoon um, in particular, is that some climate models, there are at least deficiencies that we know that the CMIP-5 suite of climate models had in being able to replicate historical trends of the monsoon. And so you can kind of see this um, observed, the blue line historical trend in an aggregated rainfall index, which I'll talk about in a second, um, versus the figure that you see underneath, which shows the box plot of the CMIP-5 uh, models that all show increasing trends over, um, an increasing trend over that same period, right? So there's kind of a disconnect here. Um, the main point of that discussion being, if I can go back, um, you can sample and come up with ways to sample the uncertainty space that the models produce, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have captured all of the uncertainty and variability within the system. That declining trend could be a result of sea surface temperatures, of aerosol effects, of processes that weren't necessarily captured by the climate models. So there's some vetting that needs to occur about which models can reliably uh, uh, replicate um, or uh, can be reliably applied to the, your domain of choice. Now, even the models that are considered good with these aggregated metrics, right? This is an all India rainfall metric. Um, it can distort some of the spatial variation that's occurring, uh, particularly in areas that are uh, very um, heterogeneous, right? Like this, um, uh, the Indian subcontinent in South Asia. Um, and so you can see that sort of in the trends um, here from 2000, blue being those increasing trends. So we need also not to just select models based upon these aggregated metrics, right? But really try to understand how they're representing the spatial variability. And then we need to find a way to encapsulate, to capture that in our um, impacts assessments. And so we can do that through a variety of approaches. I'm clearly not going into detail on these approaches. If there's, there are many that exist. Um, but one way to kind of capture that spatial information is through simple bias correction. I say simple, but they range to be very complex as well. But this is effectively just comparing model outputs with um, good observations um, to develop and apply bias adjustments and kind of enhance how real or um, locally situated these projections can be. Um, and so EasyMIP has developed a really great method to kind of preserve long-term trends, um, the historical trends in those projections and create downscaled um, scenarios that way. 
Um, there's also dynamical downscaling, um, which is using uh, process-based um, regional models, higher resolution models that are forced um, by uh, global models or boundary conditions. Um, and this can provide a lot more detail in areas that are really heterogeneous and could be very useful to AgMIF in the future. So the Cortex efforts are a great example of this. Um, but these really do rely on how good your boundary conditions are, right, um, at the edges of these models. And then finally, there are statistical downscaling techniques, which I think many people in this room have familiarity with. And that's effectively using the quantities that we know the climate models can produce very well, um, 500 millibar height anomalies, things like that, and develop relations between those and variables, maybe a rainfall that they don't do as well. And then using those relationships, we can kind of downscale um, the model outputs. We should note that for AGMIP, you know, we've been focused in the first few phases on really trying to see how can we capture the GCM uncertainty. And so we have not utilized yet, um, at least for the regional pro um, projects, any additional downscaling techniques, um, but they have potential to add a lot of value in the future as we progress with this. Okay, <clears throat> so this brings me to CMIP 6, um, which many of you have familiar with, familiarity with. And uh, many of you are probably waiting for those outputs um, and it's an exciting time. So what's new here? Um, one of the first things you'll note is that that circle looks very different compared to CMIP-5. Um, we've got our core set of experiments, um, sensitivity tests to climate forcings, radiative forcings, and our historical simulations that make up that core um, now. Um, and that is really being referred to as the entry card for your model. It allows the user to kind of contextualize where a particular model falls um, across the population of models for um, specific processes, biases, representations. Um, there are over 10 new modeling groups. Um, there's actually a climate model from uh, the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, which is very exciting to see um, that we'll be contributing. Um, a lot of these models can now be run at higher resolutions. What's a high resolution for climate modeling? Um, for global climate models, maybe a one degree by one degree. Uh, we've just frozen our GIS model, which is super exciting at two by two and a half, but we will have a one degree by one degree coming online soon. Um, and with this also comes improvement to important processes, the representation of sea ice, the representation of ENSO and modes of climate variability, um, uh, representations of aerosols have even improved. And these are all relevant to ag interactions. So that's something very heartening that we can expect from CMIP-6. Um, one of the biggest changes um, with CMIP-6 is that it takes a much more distributed view at asking and answering scientific research questions. And so um, they have endorsed CMIP um, many more MIPS than they have previously um, that are kind of exploring the processes listed on the outside of this circle. And the idea is that this might be a bit more efficient, a bit more targeted. It will help us to identify biases and systemic behaviors within the model that again is going to help our, uh, our impacts assessment communities to contextualize the models that we use. Um, now this third bullet, which is kind of near and dear to my heart, um, is that several models are now including representations of agriculture in their land surfaces. Now there's a wide variety of how this is done. It can be land cover change, it can be management such as irrigation, it can be formulations of crop growth and development. And we can talk about the utility of these from an agricultural perspective. But at a minimum, what we do expect is that, what we do expect is that um, uh, this can improve some of the um, land surface modeling and land um, uh, surface climate variables uh, for our models. And the last bullet on this, um, uh, um, CMIP has endorsed a group, um, the Vulnerability Impacts Adaptation and Climate Services Advisory Board, which will hopefully link the outputs that are being generated by the climate science community with the types of variables that are really needed, right, at the scales and resolution um, of the impacts assessment community. And this is fairly new. And AGMIP has pretty good representation on that. Um, Alex Ruane sits at, a, at a, I think, as a co-chair um, on, uh, on that board. And so there'll be a good representation of those feedbacks, those um, data feedbacks, right, between the communities. Okay, um, I might skip this for the second. Suffice it to say with this, because I'm sure economists will go through this. Um, unlike CMIT-5, where some of the RCPs were incorporated into the core set of experiments, um, CMIT-6, the future scenarios will be conducted as their own MIP, as scenario MIP. 
And this is going to provide several advantages aside from more coordinated um, analyses and targeted research questions. It also helps us to explore some of the uncertainty that you see sort of within this matrix um, and to look at, for example, overshoots, the impacts of short-lived species, um, greenhouse gas species, land use, and also the role of agriculture in mitigation, um, which is going to be very important both for the way agriculture is represented in these models and how we actually um, incorporate mitigation into our um, agricultural impacts assessments. Oops, okay, whoops, going straight through. Just a quick word on climate shocks, um, as this is an area for development, we understand that this needs to be developed in AgMIP and this needs to be a concentrated area of focus. And we believe that with the new technologies coming online and new methods, that this can be improved, um, particularly since production trends can be very different from the impacts of an extreme event. Um, and so um, to that end, AGMIP is building a framework for drought risk assessment and disaster risk reduction. I believe Alex is co-leading that. Um, so that's something you should be aware of. And we're also incorporating shocks, um, providing scenarios now, either from the historical record or future scenarios to incorporate shocks into trade network models and look at broader food system issues, which I think is going to be discussed a bit more this afternoon as well. Oops. Yeah, and this is my last slide. So this is good. Um, so, um, with respect now, we just wanted to make a quick mention on the role of sensitivity testing. There are several initiatives from the global gridded to crop specific to the regional assessments that are integrating sensitivity testing over carbon temperature, water, and nitrogen that provide a lot of benefits, right? The first one is, of course, model improvement and trying to um, understand and bracket the sensitivity of both crop and model responses. Um, and that can lead, that can help us undertake stress tests to establish um, thresholds of change, tipping points. Um, this is also useful for the climate community. It kind of allows us to run some climate sensitivity tests without actually having to run through the whole climate model application. So it provides a bit more of an efficient approach. And one of the things that we'd like to kind of bring up as a climate community, and I'll end on this, is um, what is the role of sensitivity testing? A, to integrate, can we leverage these frameworks to integrate um, extreme scenarios of climate extremes um, or shocks? Um, is there a way to do that efficiently? And is there a way we're generating so much information with these sensitivity experiments? Is there a way that we can use that in our discussion with stakeholders, right? Can we use this amount of information um, to kind of lead a conversation on agroecosystem resilience building? Um, uh, and that perhaps might augment some of the um, adaptations we're developing for these path dependent scenarios. Um, so kind of looking at that as complementary to the scenario generation that we're doing. Um, and so I think I'll leave off there. Um, any questions? We're happy to take them. Um, so thanks very much. Okay, we're going to move right through the presentations. Ahora seguimos con la siguiente presentación y dejamos las preguntas. So, which actually will be at the break time instead of lunch because of um, weather and other conditions. But Ken, please join us. Here's the clicker. Mouse. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, priorities. I'll have a little set of. Uh, evaluations and then results and somewhat suggestions of what I think I've learned from this. The crop model responses to temperature have generally been shown greater uncertainty than the response to CO2 and what's resulted from this is that some of the teams have moved on to test against elevated temperature data, the wheat and the rice groups. The wheat modelers have made some improvements. Uh, only some of the rice modelers have because I think some were stuck with what I call inertia. Uh, I'm not so sure that improvement in other crop models for that response has been done. What we've learned is that response to temperature is not affected by site calibration in the maize group. Rather, the parameterization for that is set within the processes themselves, separate coefficients, if you will. Very quickly, uh, this stuff, Pierre Marta showed a lot of this, but the error bars with the plus three, plus six, increase the standard deviation in the sensitivity, CTWN. And what the hot cereal experiment basically showed is that life cycle on the wheat was reduced 
the two top graphs, time to antithesis maturity, and the yield was being reduced. Uh, in fact, hitting a point with the ensemble, predicting uh, rice, I mean, uh, wheat production approaching failure at about 32, 33 Celsius. Oh boy, it goes fast. <laughs> if I can catch on to it. Okay, this is a, it really is jumping. Movie, yes, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, with the maze group, uh, we had four sites, but basically, like others have shown, the yield reduction with rising temperature depends where you are on the temperature response surface, greater reductions in tropical regions. Maize showing decreased life cycle with increasing temperature. And one of the things they learned is that the slope of the yield decline did not matter, whether it was the ensemble or uncalibrated or uncalibrated. And that was the point I had made before. You had a single. This is a before calibration on the maize, I mean the wheat, excuse me, the rice modeling group, testing against elevated temperature experiments in soil plant atmosphere research chambers in Florida. And there's a lot of models scatter, but the models after being calibrated at 25 Celsius mean temperature, showing greater spread at the high temperature and also missing. Here's the simulations after models were allowed to modify and the models are still over predicting the ensemble and as a group at the elevated temperature. One of the issues here is that a lot of the modelers were hesitant to make their changes based upon basically these uh, chamber experiments. The, the reason for the failure in yield at the high temperature was mostly the grain number predictions. Okay, another message is that the multi-model ensembles, uh, five or six, give a better prediction than the single model. And this is done with the wheat groups, the wheat high temperature stress, the individual variables over time. The maize team showed this, the rice team and the potato team. And we have begun to understand a little bit the causes for why an ensemble is better other than more samples out of your replicates, if you will. Here shows the, on the right, the maze group showing declining variation with increased number of models on the bottom, the same for the rice group, uh, reaching a, a sort of a beginning of a plateau at five or six. And the wheat group was showing that the number of models needed for an ensemble with confidence was increased as you started pushing the temperature up, for example. This is uh, statement number three here. Maze model showed a lot of variation in ET response, and this is the first phase. Uh, and this, uh, the x-axis is temperature here, but basically the models are showing a range of about twofold on predicted ET. Uh, one of the results from this is that uh, we went off into a test that Bruce Kimball is leading, testing the models against predicted ET from flux sites. We don't know yet about model improvement. Uh, response to carbon dioxide is less under nitrogen deficiency. And also the point is that um, the CTWNs basically is showing that the nitrogen response to basically depends on the soil supplying ability for nitrogen and also the genetic potential you put on how well the crop responds to high nitrogen. Um, we know from some experiments on rice particularly that there is less CO2 response under low nitrogen, but not all models reproduce this. I think there are problems in the models. One is that the model parameters uh, coding for nitrogen balance is not particularly robust. The other one is probably more likely, and that is that you are very poorly parameterizing soils for the nitrogen supply, particularly for these developing country environments with degraded soils. And also that models showing insufficient genetic potential are likely to show less response to CO2. 
uh, pictures. Oh, wow, this goes. Man. Okay. I did a little bit of simulations on the left with rice, site, Erie, and on the right for series wheat in Kansas. And basically, it's the response to a doubled carbon dioxide level, 350 to 700, at different nitrogen levels. And the response to, to uh, CO2 is very small, five, six, seven percent when you're having a zero nitrogen environment. And it approaches the more theoretical value of about 30 percent when you have high nitrogen. The bottom graph shows the percent response compared to 100 percent. Wow. Okay. This is an example with maize simulations that came out of the DFID project. The left panel is uh, 30 kilos of nitrogen, the right one at 180 kilos of nitrogen. Um, but it's the response to CO2. Maize showing no response, almost negative in some cases with low nitrogen. At higher nitrogen, you do get some response. Two different models, the red is Epsom and the D, uh, blue is DSAT. Surprisingly, in this example, Epsom was responding more, and I'm not quite sure why. Another lesson learned is the carbon pools uh, that you set in your model. The stable pool in the DSAT is SOM3, and F inert is basically the non-turnover uh, pool in the Epsom model, and that very much affects the yield level at zero nitrogen. Look at the, the y-axis. Uh, at zero rate. So you need both models to predicting the low yield correctly under zero end. If this is off, you get a wrong prediction to the other things you're looking at, like response to CO2 on the right-hand side. The, the one on the bottom, both are done on the right, they're done at 30 kilos of N. The one model showing good response, the other one not. Oh man, this is a, did I miss one? Yeah, here's another case in Mali on the left showing the models not being started at the same place with zero nitrogen. Uh, that has a setting of the soil carbon availability. Uh, the flat top on this is caused by genetic potential because we looked at rainfall deficit, wasn't there. Man. What do I do with this? Yeah. Okay, it's back up, but somebody's finding it for me. <laughs> okay, stop here. This one is showing genetic okay. potential being set differently between two models. Take it back. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And in this case, the mo this was corrected later in the, in the simulations, but uh, response to nitrogen depends on genetic potential. Next slide. Okay, a set of bullet points. I think we have insufficient emphasis on soil fertility in this, the whole AgNet project. Nitrogen, pools, soil carbon, also phosphorus. I'm convinced that we have less response to CO2 under phosphorus deficient crops. The theory is very good on that. We've been ignoring the long-term carryover of soil carbon degradation over time. Also water carryover, that means continuous simulations. Now, see the need for number eight says the models can do this. At least half of the models can run continuous simulations. So we just need to change the emphasis on this. Um, I'm throwing the word insufficient data sharing. Central disagreed, says there's a data journal, but I would like to see the individual modeling group share their original calibration data that uh, each of us have data. We need more sharing across that. And we also have crops not covered, uh, fruits and vegetables, and we just need to connect more to the horticulturalist. Next slide. There's more uncertainty among crop model predictions then is contributed by GCM pools. And I believe Alex showed this also yesterday. 
now this is just my own personal bias is we need more emphasis funding on improving the crop models, less of just doing more CTWNs and blindly using the models. Uh, I have a few issues with the gridded models. They have really good photosynthesis conductance in many cases, but lack the detail on the crop reproductiveness, parameterization, fertility aspects. And they need more testing against real data. Next slide. Uh, kind of a summary slide. This is where the teams are now. The wheat group is ahead of everybody. Uh, they've done the CTWN, hot cereal, cement data canopy temperature, looking at regions around the world. The rice group was in second in this race. They've done the CTW, tested against CO2 in face experiments, temperature in chambers, looking at gene-based. The maize group has done a CTW, uh, tested against CO2 face, and is right now doing a water, crop water. The sugarcane group, unfortunately, did one set of experiments with, or simulation with CTW, but I believe they're inactive. Yep, Peter says yes. Potato groups moving along fine, they just started later, and I believe they're moving on into another project with the Beyond CTW. Canola is a little bit later yet. They've done a CTW and are trying to publish the paper and I think have plans to keep moving. There was once a maize model improvement team, very nice group, sharing process understanding. Right now it's not active. So carbon team, I'm not sure about that one, Bruno Basso. The crop water team with Bruce Kimball leading is planning a second phase with ET evaluations with both wheat and maize models. Uh, pasture livestock, Susanna. Uh, there's a new team with soybean, Monsi Salmaran. The low input team is just starting with Mark Corbels, Bruno Basso. The biofuel team, I think, is inactive, but I don't know the status. And the sorghum and peanut groups, basically, we lost the leadership. And anybody that wants to move into this, we'd be welcome. Next slide. Conclusions, ensembles. Median ensemble is basically much better than any single model. So we know we need multi-model. We still have uncertainties about response to CO2 temperature water. Consistent message yield is being reduced, mostly because of shorter life cycle. Can we adapt by genetically regaining life cycle? Some teams are beginning to look at this now. And I think the problem with elevated temperature is mostly on the life cycle and also grain number set, not done particularly well. And I'd like to see more model code improvement. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. That was a very nice wrap up, Ken. Thank you very much for that. Um, so moving along, um, cognizant that we are a little bit tight on time, we have Heidi and um, Dillis pr presenting together on recent advancements in European and African assessments. And Dillis is starting. Would you like to try this yourself? Okay. So thank you for the opportunity. So um, the presentation is on recent progress in West Africa and European studies. So I will do the presentation on West African studies and Heidi would continue. Yeah, so I'll be giving a brief on two uh, uh, studies. The first one is on impact of 1.5 versus two on cereal yields in West Africa, uh, looking at the Sudan savanna. And that's a group of people who worked on it. And this is mainly the Waskal group and the ADMI group together that does this work. And we have our study sites located at the shaded portions are the regions that were studied. And the crops we worked on were millet, maize, and, and sorghum. And we had a number of varieties that were calibrated for using experimental data for this purpose. And we used about uh, more than 620 grid cells. So looking at the simulated uh, baseline weather data uh, output from the two models under current fertilizer management and also under intensified levels, 
we see that both models, that is a uh, Desart and Simplex, um, simulated the baseline yields with uh, similar distributions except for sorghum and yield increases uh, between two to three folds under the intensified uh, condition. Uh, we need to understand what the economic uh, impact of this is and also the pathway for intensification because in our case we used only fertilizer. Uh, looking at the spatial distribution of, uh, uh, of the yield in terms of variability in yield change, um, variability was higher under two degrees Celsius and also variability was higher under sorghum and millet compared to maize. Um, looking at the yield change in terms of averaging over the study area and variability, we see that the two degrees has more negative impacts, that's uh, the red boxes. And also with intensification, we have higher yield uh, reduction. Um, we didn't have much difference between the two scenarios as 1.5 and 2.0 in terms of variability. Looking at trying to understand some of the driving force behind the yield changes, we again look at the two models in terms of uh, reduction in yield and also reduction in life cycle of the crops. And uh, both models are showing reduction in life cycle of the crops. Uh, reduction in yield, of course, is higher under the intensified uh, condition. But if you look at yield reduction, you notice that simplest has a much lower yield reduction compared to uh, this set. And even though they have the same reduction in phenology, um, this might probably be due to differences in the way the, crop, the two models handle heat and drought stress. And elevated CO2 effect was very minimal, except, uh, especially with uh, the current fertilizer levels. So I want to also briefly mention another study that we did under the different funded projects. And this one looking at uh, climate change impact on smallholder livelihoods, looking at this case of uh, Neuro uh, Senegal. Uh, just to give a brief uh, summary of the crop results that we got. So under future production systems, maize yield is, uh, largely going to be negatively impacted. Millet yields will relatively be unaffected in most of the scenarios that we used. Uh, peanuts would almost always benefit from climate change except for the hot and dry scenarios. And we also observe variation uh, in terms of model output uh, between the two models that we use. So in this case, we use APSIM and DSAT. And we noticed that one of the main uh, reason for the differences was as a result of the way the two models handle sensitivity to phenology uh, based on water and nitrogen stress. And using that into a TOA model, looking at the impact on farmers' livelihood, we noticed that the changes in net returns of farmers are largely positive under climate change in the future, uh, and the future production systems. And the magnitude of these changes varied uh, depending on the scenarios that you look at and also the crop models that was used. Similarly, households were also affected. But one important thing here is that this impact is highly driven by price sensitivity. So if you use, look at a high price situation, most of the scenarios show positive impact in terms of net returns. But with low uh, prices, then you have most of them showing negative impact. So the result here is driven largely by um, the share of peanuts in the, fa uh, the farming system. To summarize the two presentation, uh, the impact at two degrees is larger no difference in variability was seen between the two uh, scenarios. 
and the negative impact increased slightly under the, inten the intensification situation. And uh, for the second one in the future production systems and socioeconomic uh, conditions, climate change is expected to have positive impact on the livelihoods of farmers in this uh, site. However, with low prices, climate change will have negative impact on the livelihoods of these farms. And I think it's interesting one other thing we'd want to do for the West African agreed uh, study would be to also carry out uh, the economic analysis to see how it will compare with what we had for the neuro case. Okay, thank you. Um, I just put this picture up to help you transition back to uh, Europe it, um, from West Africa. So this is just a picture of Scotland, I thought to kill the time. And maybe I should say, I'll present the results of two studies. One is a impact study we just finished in the Maxur project, which is essentially a a little bit like a European hub of EGMIC activities. It's many other things as well. Um, and then a second study that will lead into a, a plan, a, a next study we wanna do as a European CGRA. But I, I wanna really emphasize that there's a lot of other really interesting European impact assessments that are ongoing. And certainly I don't have time to talk about them. So I'll just highlight two initiatives. And one were these regional integrated studies from the Maxur project. So they're located at, um, for the most part, where those red dots are. And these studies, of course, depending on the location and the context, they were really looking at, the, at their farming systems and the associated environmental um, externalities with these farming systems. So they were integrating crop models, economic models, different water quality or um, other environmental models. So this was a nice uh, outcome of the Maxur project that complements nicely some of these local integrated studies done in NAGMIT. And the second, sorry, I just wanna thumb through these quickly. The second project I wanted to really emphasize is an initiative called SUS Funds. And it's a European project that really tries to set the conceptual framework as well as the modeling and analytical tools to kind of comprehensively be able to look at, on the one hand, uh, competitive agro sector in Europe, European food supply, the environmental impacts of agricultural land use activities. And on the other hand, the central role of food and nutrition security, sorry, this is nutrition security and also healthy diets and the associated disease uh, and health problems associated with diets. So the project uh, has partners from all over Europe, I think Wageningen, uh, University of Bonn, Yaza, Oxford. And it's, uh, I think, a really nice initiative to try and comprehensively bring together agricultural analysis with health, with this food as a common uh, thing. And I'm sure it has a lot of nice overlaps with the food security work and nutrition security work here in EGMIP. So, ooh, okay, moving on to, oh, sorry. I, maybe I'll ask, yeah. Moving on then to our two studies. The first one, we essentially wanted to look at what was really driving climate change impacts in crop yield changes. And we looked at two crops, maize, grain maize and winter wheat in a gridded study across Europe where we had uh, roughly eight crop models participating and we were simulating grain yields forward to a period centered on 2050 for a range of climate scenarios. And what we did that was a little bit new or in different was we decompose the sources of loss under climate change into these different factors. And um, we focused on uh, change in what we called mean temperature effects, essentially this loss in the growing season as temperatures warm. The second factor is related to water stress or drought and essentially warmer temperatures create a higher vapor pressure deficit and a greater water demand. Third factor we looked at was heat stress. So it was really large losses associated with even a 
short time of uh, very a few days of high temperature, usually around anthesis. And the fourth factor we explicitly looked at was the CO2 effects, and we tried to get the interaction between those last three factors as well. So I show this a little bit complicated figure, but just to kind of visualize what our method was. So I'm showing here for winter wheat, the five main producing countries by area in Europe. Um, and there's a few time periods, I can't uh, use a pointer, but you see in the baseline period, the black vertical line where most of those red triangles are represents essentially potential yield levels. And then where the blue dots you see coming backward, that would be yield levels when you include water limitation. And then when you include uh, heat limitation to after the water is accounted for, those are the green dots. Um, and heat stress on its own are the red. So we, just to show this as our methodology of how we did the analysis. And before moving into that, I'll say we, we evaluated how well our models performed in the baseline climate against real yields at both national and subnational level. And we saw that the mean temperature effects for both crops were explaining about 25% of year to year variation in our historical data. And adding water limitation for maize could explain another 24% of variation. So across Europe, certainly there was a lot of variation country to country, whereas including water limitation could only explain another 2% of variation for winter wheat. Um, so this was a little bit surprising at first for us. And, uh, okay, so, uh, sorry, I have, I think just three more. So just to say, we, we had some insights that uh, essentially our models were not capturing the yield, yield response to too much water, whether that's disease lodging or uh, water logging. So then to look at the results, essentially what we see here is that Oops, sorry, drought intensified for maize. That's uh, this panel here showing these blue, uh, blue dots for each of the RCPs that drought would get stronger as well as beyond the shortening of the growth season. So even with a shorter cycle, drought was intensifying. On the other hand, we found for wheat that drought was actually decreasing a little bit. Um, and the two shades just show the, the role of CO2 or the, um, the role that CO2 had in actually reducing the drought effect, uh, particularly in maize, you see it for the higher RCP forcings. On the other hand, when we looked at heat stress, we see that heat stress intensified for both crops. However, it intensified from essentially uh, causing on average over 30 years a 1% loss to upwards of about a 2 or 3% loss from potential levels. So heat stress intensified a lot, but it still was a much smaller source of loss as compared to, um, okay, I can't go back, as compared to the drought stress was still a much larger source of loss. And finally, we looked at what was driving yield losses in the worst years. So we took in our 30 year simulation period, essentially the yields from the lowest decile and looked what was the source of additional yield losses in those years. And for both crops, there was again an additional shortening of the, of the season, but the main source of additional loss was extra drought. And that was true in both the baseline conditions and under climate change, and heat stress didn't drive the losses in those very low yielding years. Um, so to summarize this, we. Oh, last thing for these low yielding years, we see in these cases, CO2 was not able to offset these losses. So in the driest years with no more water in your profile, there was no longer the, addition, the um, uh, beneficial effect of CO2. And also to point out here, we see that with elevated CO2, our heat stress effects are of course a little bit uh, stronger than they are without the CO2. So to summarize this study, we see very different outlook between the two crops, suggesting irrigation is probably an effective mitigation uh, for both of these effects, heat and drought, but this would need an economic analysis and also understanding what happens to water resources under climate change. So then quickly, the last study, we essentially, we wanted to ask in integrated assessments where we look at climate change impacts also on land use, crop prices, total production, and uh, emissions, so leaching and 
uh, various greenhouse gas emissions. How sensitive are the outcomes here on land use and production, uh, nitrogen losses, to assumptions we make about crop management. So we used uh, for a number of climate scenarios, we fed them in a crop model, we took historical yield trends, and we gave these to our land use model, which is Capri. Um, and essentially what we then did is we added on three different adaptation cases into the crop model. And we'll talk about Capri. And we, we wanted to see how those assumptions about adaptations affected the variant the output variables, and we assumed number one, no adaptation. So the dumb farmer scenario in 50 years, the farmer will still do the same practice they do now. Number two is optimal adaptation, essentially the genius farmer that knows the weather in advance for the next 30 years and will pick the sowing date to optimize yield, uh, sowing date and variety to optimize yield 30 years in advance. And the third case we call an actual adaptation and we essentially correct it that optimal case for how much baseline yields were already not optimized because of um, essentially factors our crop model do, that do not consider related to economic constraints, but also maybe water logging, uh, uh, frost, needing frost, something. And I should say we did this for six crops. And this is essentially just saying that, that when you look across the different variables we analyze, so this would be crop yield just coming out of the crop model with the climate change and CO2 effect, the difference between that actual adaptation case and the optimal case was up to 15 percentage points. So if there was a positive 10 percent uh, yield gain with an optimal adaptation for, uh, this is aggregated across all Capri crops, it would be a minus five loss if you use the actual adaptation. So it, was, it made a very large difference on our crop yields, but by the time we moved after the economic optimization, so looking at land use and production, and then the, uh, the nitrogen losses, you see that that difference almost disappears. So there's a lot of interesting questions here also about the validity of using a partial equilibrium approach to study climate change effects. But essentially what we can conclude here is that technology assumptions driving the economic analysis were much larger than the yield changes due to climate change. And this really causes us to reflect, I think also as crop modelers uh, to, uh, for our next going forward in the CGRA to think perhaps we really need to look rather at what is driving these technology and are what the economic models are assuming for technology growth. Uh, so yield growth going forward, are they physically consistent with what we know breeders are investing in or with efforts to close yield gaps? So this is an area we would like to continue on. And my last slide here is, quickly just to show the variation we had with what was our optimal adaptation for a, the kind of a new variety under climate change. And I show it just for maize and wheat here. And you essentially see there's a high amount of spatial variability. So this question of uh, that Ken raised, can you buy back the lost season due to, um, by adopting a longer season variety really will depend on how much heat and drought stress will intensify. And we saw in many cases that it was uh, better to actually have a shorter season variety. So that was pink, suggesting that heat and drought intensified more, you wouldn't gain your season back. And I'll skip the last part. This was just showing the optimal adaptation. And I'll let uh, Dillis uh do the last she wanted we'll do the last slide <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah okay so to conclude and um we have identified a few similarities between the two studies that both were on gridded framework and this frameworks are established there is a common decomposition method use and then the technology assumptions that were taken are also important in the outcome. The differences, of course, where there are different, uh, um, I mean, we have a tropical condition versus uh, temperate, and then the C3 crop versus the C4. Um, data issues and models, funding availability issues are, I mean, vary between the two sides. The regions also define major challenges and priorities. And the next 
<clears throat> sorry, the next steps mainly will be to include some of the socioeconomic analysis, as well as look more into detail what kind of technologies to use. And also one very important one is the carryover effects, uh, particularly in the West African situation, and also to include more stakeholder engagement. This are uh, common along uh, between the two sites, but then the carbon dioxide, uh, sorry, carbon, soil carbon uh, carry over is very important in the temp uh, for the tropical situation. Thank you. I think you can see that each of these studies probably would be benefited by a half hour presentation. They're all fabulous. I'm sorry that we're a little bit restricted on time, but anyway, we'll happily welcome uh, Christoph uh, for the next presentation on some of the main messages from Global Gridded work. Here you go. Thanks. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I will rush you through what we do in GGCMI and uh, we'll then come to a few general observations that I think are also important for ACMAP as a whole. Um, but, okay. So first, what has happened and others than the others, I can not move it or can, I can move it a lot, okay. <laughs> okay, so while well, we started out in 2012, basically as an offspring of Zizima project, uh, very successful, seven models, 18 papers. We're still working on, on additional papers from that output, followed up by this historical evaluation phase, uh, doubled the number of models, five papers already published, six in the making. Um, we have this online crop model evaluation tool, which I think is a major achievement for, for standards in how to compare models. Then. Last year, the HAPPY and the easymip to be as a service to the 1.5 degree report of the IPCC. And you see, uh, again, less models and much less output. So one paper for HAPPY and none planned. easymip to be no papers, but one planned. And uh, we are now in phase two, which is the CTWNA. And I agree with you, Ken, that it's not only about like doing another CTW, but uh, the idea here is really to understand what are the response patterns in space and across models and use that as an, as an information for how to improve and like what are the major differences that we actually see. But the main point, I'm, I, that's why I put these papers here, is I, I think we are losing traction and um, we have to, I think that's true for ACMAP as, as a whole, we have to think about how to move from um, this energetic start into some stable and, and uh, sustainable structures. Um, so just quickly, so CTWNA, uh, that was already mentioned. So we have a lot of data and uh, 13 crop models uh, contributing, five crops. Um, and as I already said, the quest is understanding how models respond uh, to these changes and um, but also emulating so that if you cannot build an emulator of crop response on this databases you will not be able to so we hope to to have some progress on that especially for the integrated assessment and the economic assessments where then these emulators will allow for a lot of feedbacks that are currently not possible um, just to give you an impression of the work we are doing on this, so these are impact response surfaces for the water on the y-axis and the temperature dimension on the x-axis for the 13 different models that developed da uh, the delivered data. And uh, as you can see, we allowed for different levels of participation because we thought that asking for 1,400 simulations from each group would maybe shy away a few groups. So we asked for subsets and then we can of course uh, extrapolate this is not working super well no, too well <laughs> okay um, you can basically fill then these impact response surface and you already see that um, at the global aggregation there are differences to models like the upper row the third from the right has more or less vertical lines, and the one below that has more or less horizontal lines. So the temperature or the temp uh, water response are much stronger. And uh, you can do that for every of the 
roughly 40,000 pixels that we simulated and then try to understand like what are the spatial domains where water versus temperature C versus N uh, dominates the model's response and derive insights from that, hopefully. So that's ongoing. Um, this is work by uh, Sara, who also has a poster downstairs um, on the adaptation dimension. And this basically shows the temperature level up to which the regaining of the growing season can fully compensate the damage from, from the warming. And you see that in the high latitudes, basically, that is an effective measure up to six degrees, which is what how far we went. But especially in the tropics, regaining the growing season is not necessarily a good idea or not, not a sufficient measure to, to compensate the original damage from the heating. Um, and lastly, um, even though this is not, well, this is not like there's not much to display. So the emulators, um, you can derive or develop emulators for very different things, individual years, average multi-annual uh, conditions, uh, individual pixels for regions and so on. And we are there in contact with mainly the integrated assessment community. We already realized that there's strong nonlinear behavior in the end dimension, and we probably will have to develop separate emulators for the different end levels that we have. We have to think about where to do the aggregation, so before emulating or after emulating. Um, and we've tested quadratic, cubic, and Gaussian um, approaches. And the map just shows like one sample of, of a fully quadratic emulator with 15 parameters basically reproducing much of the simulated original response of the DSAT model, PT sat model. Okay, um, the t-shirt I'm wearing is not a fashion accident, but I, um, for one, I wanna advertise this journal because I think modelers and also people that write protocols should be aware of it, that this is an excellent outlet for it. But also I want you to enable you to find me. Um, that's why I wear a bright orange because um, we do need your help in digesting all the data that we've produced. So there's lots of opportunities in this super huge data rich uh, five dimensional cube that we have. Uh, we do have also much more ideas of what to do than we can actually do. Uh, we don't only have data on yield, but we have like three and more productivity measures, uh, phenology, water, nitrogen, fluxes. So they, you can also basically expand your type of research questions much beyond yield. Um, we are a very active group, so it's easy to engage and kind of get feedback. We have B-weekly calls and have a project management software with like a wiki and a ticket system. So that's relatively easy to, to um, find information and to request feedback. And yeah, it's if you don't come and help us, there will be many super ripe, very low hanging fruits that we will have to rot uh, and um, not harvest. So please come and see me. Um, so that is uh, basically the uh, show of what's going on has happened. And now I want to kind of reflect a little bit on what I think will have to happen for uh, enabling us to carry on in the future. And it basically has two elements. So first of all, like to, uh, in order to be provocative a little bit, I think the Paris Agreement has killed our standard um, impact assessments that we've done so far. Because if you're looking at the end of the 21st century under an RCP 8.5, model uncertainty is not so bad because the signal is very strong. Now, if you look at near term, very low climate change scenarios, what you see here is like, like the, the larger box plot is the global aggregation and the map in the background shows that this basically is a pattern that you see for different regions. So the uncertainty is much larger than the overall signal. And there's very little to learn from these kind of assessments. And we have to think about how to carry on in that kind of political framework. We can also say, well, the, the existence of Paris is an achievement that we contributed to and we can be proud of actually having done the work that we did. But now we kind of have to readjust what the, the new targets will be. Um, the second is um, basically we all started out and wanted to be like Centold. You can 
write NYCHA climate change papers on every phase that you generate. And uh, that, of course, is very attractive. So you get people joining you. And like, um, so it's that's being the cool gang is, is like good to get things started. But it's not necessarily a good thing to kind of continue over years. And uh, even Sandholt did not manage to get a nature climate change paper in phase three. Um, um, so we kind of have to find new incentives for people to continue working with us. Um, ooh. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Mm. No. So the question is, how do we build lasting structures and kind of keep the flies uh, around us? And I think um, we have to move away from the climate only focus because agriculture is much more than just like what is the impact of changing climate. But we have to be very clear on what our objectives are also in the individual studies. Uh, it's often vaguely like we do some scenarios and then we later on kind of try to interpret things in different directions, but I, have, I think we have to be very clear of what the purpose of the things we do is. We have to be very clear who our customers and addressees are, because I, again, think just the IPCC is not sufficient. We have to create funding, and uh, we guess uh, well, we at least have to admit that uh, the idea of generating funding for the entire group simply failed. And we will have to think about new ways of uh, how we can join, generate funding for, for the participants. And I think the first point here is have diverse entry points, like topic wise is an important uh, element there. Um, so yeah, I think especially at the global scale, the, the most important dimension to improve on is that we need to improve on the representation of management both in how the models can represent it and what the data we have. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing a map from Jonas that shows the distribution of irrigation systems, so sprinkler drip and surface irrigation. Um, he has done a lot of analysis on also what these impacts are. And it's nice because it's, well, one, it's management data and something that models would have to represent these different types of, of irrigation. And it is also another aspect of agriculture beyond yield. Huh? It's on water usage and um, resource availability. Um, yeah, the second point I already basically said that. And also, I think we have to move away from like multi annual averages that we are reporting. Like at the end of the century, the impact is between 10 and 20%. We really have to look at different metrics like what happens to the bad, really bad years and what happens to the really good years. And these kind of uh, does the distribution of things change rather than just reporting a mean. Because I think that kind of information will help many people to engage with our data and kind of make sense in their um, background from what we do. Um, so the proposal is to become Spider-Man. So uh, instead of having a pot of beer that attracts flies, we need a net that kind of keeps them. And uh, as the Global Gridded Crop Modeling Group, well, so far we've basically focused on the IPCC and did climate impact analysis. Um, and that basically blends nicely into the, into the objective of EasyMIP. Uh, we've also supplied like our information to the land use modeling community and the Ag Econ group here and the entire CGRA framework in AgMIP. So those two flies are already in our net. But uh, you can think of many more applications where agricultural modeling is important and um, as you can see, uh, I've just listed a few examples here, and um, there are many question marks on who the customers for that would actually be, but I'm sure there are customers out there, and if we are able to address these topics, then maybe with these customers and these research questions, we can also generate funding and the idea on how to do that is, I think, we need a very small core scenario set, and that small core scenario set as in CMIP is the idea to describe model uncertainty. And against this small core scenario set, that's small enough that people still have resources to do extra simulations 
for their research questions and projects, they can then do their multi-dimensional or multi-topic-wise analysis and uh, basically by that promote the entire group's effort to move forward. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. There's an alternative translation of ACMAP and please come all and help us to become Spider-Man. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Lots to think about there. Um, and we have now a big data uh, presentation that Gideon Kruzman is giving. Andy Jarvis was unable to join us. So we're very thankful that Gideon is uh, giving this presentation. Thank you. Um, how, uh, how many people knew about the CGIAR platform for big data and agriculture before coming to this meeting? Oh. Well, it's not too bad, but it's not a lot. How many of you who've just raised your hands have been actively engaged in the platform? And it's a very small, there's three three or four people there. So um, that's basically what, uh, what I want to do now is introduce uh, uh, the big data platform uh, uh, to you and um, to see how we can move, uh, move forward uh, because there are a lot of a uh, lot of points of uh, of synergy there. Um, yeah. uh, so let me just uh, uh, show you a couple of facts, uh, which are related to uh, to data to data, uh, and you might not directly say, okay, well, what does that mean for me? But we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, there is an increasing number of people, especially in uh, in low and middle income countries, um, that have access uh, access to uh, to mobile phones, um, and many of them have uh, very simple smartphones as well. Um, there is more people who have access to a mobile phone than they have to a toilet. Uh, so that's something uh, that was probably inconceivable about ten years ago. And that that would be the case, but that is that is actually uh, the case, and that is a game changer in terms of data collection uh, and the way that you can utilize uh, utilize uh, out, uh, data data driven outputs. Uh, for instance, things that coming that are coming out of models uh, into actionable products that can reach uh, that can reach people. Um, Another fact, uh, there is a huge amount of satellites uh, currently uh, orbiting the Earth, um, collecting data, data that we can use uh, for, uh, for the types of things that we, that we do. And because the modeling work that we do uh, is very much data-driven. Uh, data so it's about the data that you collect uh, and that you can, that you, that you can uh, harness. Um, an example of this is um, you can use uh, data that you get from uh, from remote uh, from remote sensing uh, to uh, to address uh, to look and analyze uh, things on the ground where you can actually not get to very easily. For instance, war torn zones like Syria. Um, oops. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The next slide, please. Yeah. And um, there is, uh, there are an increasing number of smart, cheap sensors available. Um, uh, and through the Internet of Things, uh, you're able to access them easily. Uh, which creates a large uh, uh, big data streams that you can that you can utilize. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so, what does the platform for big data in agriculture uh, want want to do? It wants to solve um, agricultural development problems faster, better, and a greater scale. That's one part. Next slide, please. Um, we also aim at harnessing the capabilities of big data to accelerate and enhance the impact of international agricultural research for development. 
And those are the two, those are the two main aims. They're, they're kind of like the flip sides of the same coin. Next slide, please. Um, now, what you need to really keep in mind is that it's a platform in name, but it's basically an innovation hub. Uh, so it's not a place where all the data is being collected uh, from across the CGIAR, and uh, you can. Uh, but it's it's a place it's a place a place for collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, it's um, the uh, the big data platform has three main components. The first component is or, uh, is organized. It's about getting the. Uh, the uh, the CGIAR's data act together in order to to ensure that the data can be that that is available in the CGIAR um, can be used. Next slide, please. Um, really important in that is a concept called fair. Uh, is that the data that data has to be fair? That it is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, so the findable. The uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the data is uh, located uh, of the CGIAR in uh, in the 15 centers uh, uh, distributed across uh, across the globe. Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, next slide. Yeah. And right uh, right up to recently, that was located on a multitude of laptops, not very accessible, uh, except for the researcher who was using that. So the idea was to get uh, get the information, archive it. Next slide, please. And get it into into um, into data repositories, um, silos, uh, where uh, where that data can be found more easily than that it's uh, located in all those laptops, and ideally, next slide please, you get it into larger silos so that it's even easier to uh, to. Uh, to uh, to get to next slide please um so in terms of the um, uh, the the it, the uh, the the uh, the the find the findability and the accessibility it also means you have to know what is in the in the data so having good metadata is uh, is essential and a lot of the data metadata metadata in the cg uh, the lots of the data sets in the cgiar have a uh, a standard set of uh, metadata attached to it, which describes what it is. Uh, so uh, the kind uh, listing some key uh, keywords key uh, so that you can find maze data sets by by looking for maze, and you will you you will find them. Next slide, please. Um, for the interoperability, um, that is really really important, but it's not enough. Next slide, please. Um, you need for uh, for interoperability. You need uh, you need to have um, some uh, two aspects to it. Uh, a way that you can actually uh, use machines uh, to, uh, to 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 get to the data, uh, so that it's not just uh, finding uh, two thousand data sets and then going through them uh, manually to find whatever you want to do, but to have uh, have have quer queryable options to do so. But that requires not only the syntactic in uh, interoperability, but also, next slide please, um, a semantic interoperability. Uh, you have to be sure that people uh, that the that the things that you name in your data data set actually uh, that people understand what it means. And so an example is uh, if you say plant, uh, one person will think of a, of a factory, another one of, uh, of a little a thing grow, uh, grow, uh, growing in the ground. Um, uh, so those are really important things. So that means that uh, the description of that data becomes essential. Next slide, please. Um, Within the CGIAR, we are working on a, uh, a, a data, a metadata harvester uh, linked to all the data repositories within the CGIAR. Um, the, the website is uh, up there in the, in, in the top right-hand cor corner. It's work in progress. So um, uh, it's not, it's certainly not perfect at this, uh, at this moment, but it does uh, point to a large number of data sets, many of them uh, that have actually quite good uh, 
descriptive metadata so you can find those kind of uh, data sets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our, the second component is convene. Uh, the convene is, you know, getting people, getting people together. And that's done in, in, in basically two main ways. The first one, next slide, please. Um, is our big data convention. We had our first one last year in Cali in uh, uh, in September. Our next one is going to be in Nairobi in October of this year. Uh, of this year. And this is an uh, uh, an invitation to everybody uh, who's interested in these kind of things. Please come to Nairobi in the first week of October. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second component of, of this is our communities of practice. We have six communities of practice within the big data platform. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, one is on data-driven agronomy. Uh, so it's basically harnessing, uh, harnessing data um, uh, uh, to uh, to to improve uh, the uh, agronomic practices, so it's related to precision precision agriculture, um, um, but very much focused on uh, on uh, low and middle income uh, uh, low and middle income countries. And um, next slide, please. Um, there are, uh, we have also a, um, a specific uh, community of practice working on ontologies. Uh, the issue of making data interoperable um, uh, hinges to a large extent on uh, being able uh, to having controlled vocabularies and ontologies um, that uh, that people uh, uh, can agree on, where uh, which make it possible uh, to combine uh, combine data sets and to understand data sets. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, we basically combine that to 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 uh, to make the interoperability possible. Next slide, please. Um, then we have a, a community of practice on crop modeling. Uh, which ones of the who who here is a crop modeler? Yeah, and I'll dr drop your hand, uh, keep your hands up, and then how many of you uh, were aware of this community of practice? Yeah, so that's a very very small number. I think there that's a missed a missed opportunity so far. So I think it's it would be a really good idea uh, to bring those to uh, those, uh, the community of practice on crop modeling, uh, which is doing the G by E by M by S um, uh, uh, within the CGIAR, uh, focused very much on lower and middle income countries, uh, on our mandate, uh, on our mandate crops. Um, uh, Together with the expertise available in in AgMIP, uh, which will also allow uh, allow some really uh, interesting new uh, new venues. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then we have a uh, the geospatial uh, the consortium for spatial information uh, CSI. That's a community of practice which already existed for a long time. Uh, focusing on geospatial information systems uh, within the uh, CGIAR, and they basically became part of the, the big data platform. Um, next slide, please. Then there is the community of practice on socioeconomic data. Uh, that's, uh, that's the community of practice that I lead. And um, the objective is, one of the objectives is to make the high variety uh, socioeconomic big data accessible and interoperable uh, and to create more impact and to measure, uh, to measure it. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's been estimated that every year the CGIAR surveys uh, 180,000 smallholders across the globe. Um, that information is not readily accessible and available. We want to we want to change that. Uh, that will which will allow all kinds of thing uh, all kinds of things uh, uh, that were that were that we were early, discussed earlier in the panel uh, to take place. Next slide, please. Um, then there is a the livestock data for uh, for the for decisions. This is a um, uh, uh, a community of practice that joined uh, recently joined our uh, our platform. They're self-funded out of the University of Edinburgh, focusing on livestock data. 
Uh, next slide, please. Then our last, uh, the last component of the big data platform is uh, is what we call Inspire. That's um, the idea of leading by example to ensure uh, to see how uh, to show how you can use uh, data uh, to Im uh, to uh, to improve uh, live uh, livelihoods. Next slide, please. Um, uh, for, uh, we identified last year uh, four topics um, and uh, offered uh, uh, one uh, one hundred thousand uh, dollar innovation prizes um, and uh, for a t for twelve month grants. Uh, and the idea was we wanted to see risky ideas, something really innovative, with uh, with uh, with uh, cool partnerships uh, with between both the CGIAR. Uh, um, stakeholders and partners outside of the CGIAR. Next slide, please. Um, these are these were uh, we had 130 uh, application um, uh, submissions to the Inspire. Most of them of excellent quality. Uh, I know there is a couple of people uh, here in the room who submitted uh, who submitted an Inspire proposal. Um, but there was so there uh, in the end there were five uh, five were uh, were chosen doing some really interesting uh, interesting stuff. Um, next slide, please. So that's uh, that basically is an introduction to the big data platform. If you're interested I I into it, um, yeah, talk to me and uh, I'll I'll help you get uh, get linked up uh, to uh, to the platform. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists. We have time for maybe one or two observations or questions. If you'd like to say something or comment, please raise your hand so we can run a microphone back to you. Um, okay. Hang on. Thanks, Rob. Well, excellent talks, great summaries. Um, not unexpectedly, I want to ask a, or make a point about Ken's um, reflections on what we've learned about crop modelling through our journey in AgMIP. Um, one of the things we have learnt, but it hasn't really surfaced in terms of having objective data, is the impact of the modeller on the model outputs, which, um, you know, evidence in the wheat group of that showing as great a variability um, as there is between the models. And so that could be an area of capacity building that we need to look at in future to um, have more consistency in the application of the models. And um, Ken, I think you know that some of those problems you showed around soil organic matter modeling and parameterization, you know, came about because it's a tough area. We, you know, still struggling to know how you really do that properly. And so you have a lot of uh, opportunity for heterogeneity between the choices people make. I'd just say that I would say that I put the slide. Yeah, I agree with the comment that the modeler makes a difference. Yeah, it's okay. Just use this one. It's okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, I agree that the modeler makes a difference, and especially with that soil carbon, the inputs. If you're reinterpreting the inputs are basically what we have as missing assumptions, you know, initial conditions with soil water, soil nitrate, ammonium, and organic carbon pools, it's, it's tough. Or the assumption that this experiment had no pest damage, but really it did. You know, so, yeah, the modeler makes a difference. One more. Uh, yeah, also thanks from my side for the very good presentation. That's a question for Dillis, Heidi, and Christoph. You all stress the need of yeah, considering better management technology development. At which resolution would we like to consider that? Perhaps spatially, but also perhaps in terms of the management activities. Any ideas already on this? Um, I think it would depend on the purpose for uh, the study. So we may have to look at different resolutions. 
um, maybe starting from the farmer level and then moving up to maybe the regional or global st uh, scale. That's what I think. But if I may add to it, I think what we need in the end is the ability to actually model management patterns. And we've tried that for sowing dates. We are trying to do that for variety selections. Um, but there will never be an as good representation of act, uh, actual management. And even if you had, you would have to have assumptions on how that changes under whatever scenario you're considering. So the ability to mimic farmers' decisions in how they change their management according to changing environmental or political or whatever conditions is an essential task mm -hmm. that we have to tackle. Yeah, I agree on this and I like the, the idea. I was just curious how far the thinking already is in terms of considering it. Okay, I don't know what Heidi wants to. Okay, so, um, well, let's give our panel a, a, another round of applause. It was an excellent <clears throat> session. Um, our photographer will now guide us uh, to the location where we will take our group photos. This is going to put some uh, time adjustments in our schedule, but um, I think the main thing is that we're going to do that, try to wrap that up by 11. We'll have a break, um, and we need to be starting promptly at 11.30, no later than. So we will start um, again at 11.30.